Song never fails to get me going. Hi, uh, everybody. Welcome to the July edition of The Watch Club, product of the uh, Newburyport Documentary Film Festival. I am Program Director James Sullivan. Very glad you're here. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this month's film because we are The Watch Club. And I often say that we are like a book club, but for documentary films. And this month's film uh, is called Join or Die, which is a film about how uh, the decline in membership uh, among Americans in civic organizations and clubs of all sorts has impacted our democracy. Um, it's a great film if you haven't seen it yet. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and actually what we should do now is just take a quick look at the trailer for those of you who maybe want to refresh your memories or haven't had a chance to watch the film yet. So this is Join or Die. This is Bob. Bob's a big fan of clubs. I belong to everything. That's my high school bowling team. I'm the tall in the middle. And this is a film about why you should join one and how Bob discovered that the fate of America depends on it. It's Harvard professor and award-winning writer Robert Putnam. You've been described as the poet laureate of civil society. Robert D. Putnam. For deepening our understanding of community in America. He made people pay attention to a concept that most people had never paid attention to. Social capital. Social capital. Social capital. Social networks have value. I'd like to call on Professor Robert Putnam, who gave us the concept of social capital. The number of people who know one another's first name, the number of people who take part in community organizations, the level of trust and reciprocity in the community. The places that have better government are the places that have a long history of social or social capital. Your chances of dying over the next year are cut in half by joining one group. Bowling Alone. Where'd you get the title? I happened to run into a friend who owned a bowling alley. And he said, gosh, Bob, you don't know it, but you've stumbled onto the major economic problems facing my industry. Because although more Americans are bowling than ever before, bowling is up in America. Bowling in leagues, bowling in teams is off by about 60%. Everything that reflects connections with other people are going down. How many times last year did you go to church? Down. How many times did you go to a dinner party? Down. How many times last year did you go to a club meeting? In barely a couple of decades, half all the civic infrastructure in America had simply vanished. It's equivalent to saying half of all the roads in America just disappeared. Everyone has a feeling something's happening, but then he's got charts to actually show what's actually happening. Whatever's happening in the people's sense of mutual obligation, to their understanding about the common good, to their willingness to trust their neighbor, is no longer going on because people are bowling alone. The book Bowling Alone, which you're familiar with by yep. Robert Putnam. The activity may still be going on, but there's no social capital being built. That decreases the trust we have in one another. How lonely Americans are, how divided. You know, he may have been on to something. We have to see loneliness as a threat to our health security and to our overall national security. We are trying something that hasn't been done before, which is growing and sustaining a multiracial democracy. Politics and policy ultimately depends on the social health of our country. Organization, connections with other people, is the only way you get big change. Democracy is a pain in the ass. If it was just easy, no one would have to go to a meeting and it would all just be fair and easy. You should join, your kids should join, and if there's not an organization you want to join, create one. America doesn't have to be the kind of America that you've lived in your whole life. You could decide to change history. Democracy is a pain in the ass. I love that line. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome co-director Rebecca Davis into the Watch Club. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Um, so you directed the film, co-directed with your brother, Pete. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Pete is a little under the weather this evening, correct? Yes. He's very sad he could not join us, but um, sends his hellos. Um, and hopefully I can answer any Pete-related uh, questions I'm also. Sure, I'm sure um, But that was can. the voice you were hearing from throughout the film, the narration right. is Pete. Yep. Right. Um, so I think, and, and I, for anyone who is uh, unaware or uh, hasn't yet watched the film, uh, I don't know if it's if if this was said in the trailer or not, but Pete was actually a student of Bob Putnam's at yes. Harvard, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. 
So he was a student of Bob's about a decade ago. Um, so, and we approached Bob about being in the film in 2017. So we're, you know, many years into this journey. COVID was, you know, yeah. we would have had no idea that that was kind of heading our way um, at the time that we started production. So um, my first question for you is, how has this not happened before? I mean, Bowling Alone came out tw uh, 20, about 25 years ago, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, for anyone who, you know, uh, pays attention to civic engagement or um, community activity, you've probably heard of the book and uh, some of the ideas behind it. Um, I, I can't imagine no other filmmaker ever approached Bob to do it. Did, did, did that happen? But he just chose to, he didn't want to do it and then decided to do it with his former student. So Bob had had, you know, a fair amount of stuff that was like really geared, I think more at like a PBS, um, audience, like educational, uh, yeah. films, you know, and had been, been interviewed. So he had, he had certainly been in other films, but, um, not, uh, you know, a project um, that was really looking to reach like a very, very wide um, popular audience as we tried to um, in our attempt to make uh, this film with a, a rip roar and ride through civic decline. <laughs> so my brother and I like to <laughs> do it while we were on it, you know, like obviously this material is, is very heavy and very hard. Um, but um, in doing a, a film on something that was, you know, about an intense subject, we wanted it to also have moments of levity, celebration, you know, choices that we made around using bright colors when we were yeah. showing the data, um, in celebrating America's rich history while also, you know, confronting these issues. Yeah, I don't even think of the film as heavy. You know, I mean, yes, of course, the subject is heavy. You know, our, is our democracy <laughs> imperiled? Um, that's pretty heavy. But uh you know, but the, but the film is 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 a lot of fun and lively and moves quickly and the animation is ridiculous, which we'll get to in a while in a little bit. But I want to ask about that. I really love it. Um, can you? So I don't know if I, I want to show this because uh, I don't know if we'll, people will be able to see this or not. But this is a join or die pin. If I bring it closer, you're not going to be able to see it. But it's the joiner. It's the famous join or die cartoon that Ben Franklin famously printed in the mid 1700s to get the colonies to unite. Um, I, I just picked, I was in uh, upstate New York and uh, the, the Fort Stanwick's in Rome, New York has a connection to the join or die story. So they have all this stuff and I t-shirts and flags and stuff. And I bought a pen. So, uh, but um, the, the film that, that the idea of calling the film that that seems pretty heavy, actually, that's like, Hey, you know, uh, so a provocative title. I yeah. mean, and I think that was definitely a choice. And in the course of production and running that title by different people, not everyone cared for it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is really the call to action that, you know, we want um, people that watch this film to come out of it feeling that there is like a level of seriousness to joining up in things um, that have real implications, as you mentioned, for our democracy. So the strength of our democracy living on for a long time in that sense, we, we don't want that to die. Um, and then as we discuss in the film, the, the physical and personal implications um, for our health, which have only become, you know, that much more urgent as we've come out of COVID um, as far as, uh, the, the health related uh, benefits of social connection. Right. Um, I'm going to make a quick mention that uh, whoever's watching right now, if you would like to pose your own question of Rebecca, all you need to do is type it into the comments section on YouTube. And uh, if I haven't already asked it, uh, we will uh, do our best to pose the question to Rebecca and have her answer it. So let us know. Um, so, Tell me a little bit about some of the clubs that you, uh, well, actually tell me this, Rebecca, if you don't mind, I think we, before we went on air, you started to tell me a little bit about yours and Pete's family background, where you grew up. And yeah. I think you said that your family was pretty civically engaged. Can you t tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, Pete, so Pete and I are a brother sister filmmaking team. Um, we had no intention of ever going into work together. It just um, <laughs> ended up happening, uh, you know, as we, decided that this was an idea that we really wanted to pursue. I had been working in film production um, for about a decade in news business at NBC News. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, I was covering a lot of the symptoms of Bob's work on the ground. I was covering school shootings. I was covering... Yeah. 
um, rising suicide rates, um, drug overdoses, a lot of things that related to isolation, the loneliness crisis. Yeah. And I knew about Bob and his work because my brother, you know, when I would be home was always talking about Bob in this class. And um, and the town that my brother and I grew up in, Falls Church, Virginia, uh, outside Washington, was also a very civic town. So, you know, we were all members of tons of clubs, very active PTA. Uh, you know, and my brother and I lived the experience of seeing the benefits of, of growing up, um, feeling like, you know, you really had a, a tight community that was kind of encouraging you. And my brother and I went out in our own lives to always create clubs and organizations as we went to other places, because that just seemed like the normal thing to do. Um, but as we got out in the world, we, we were seeing you know, that that was not normal uh, everywhere and anymore. And Bob's data certainly backs that up. Um, and so, yeah, it was in 2017 when, you know, my brother and I just kind of had a casual conversation like, oh, has there been a doc about Bob? I was thinking about a lot of these issues from my work. And, you know, we decided, you know, we knew Bob was actually about to retire soon. Mm -hmm. So I think that also gave us a moment to be like, let's try to film Bob's last class, mm. see what happens with that. And how do we open up this class at Harvard that only, you know, however many students that we're going through every year got to attend? How do we open up that one on one class on the ideas of Bob Putnam, mm. um, you know, to everyone in the country so that all Americans could take his class um, and have some takeaways? Do, do you have other siblings? Or is it you it's and just Pete? Pete. Just, just Pete and I. Yep. And do you mind if I ask, like, sort of, you know, can you give me a few examples of clubs that your parents were in that they modeled for you that they were that you know that they were part of? Totally. Yeah. So my my father um, was very active on like the English as a second language um, organization in our town that helped to kind of welcome mm -hmm. new immigrants to our community and helped with the curriculum um, that was taught in, in the schools. My father had lived in Latin America for a long time and spoke Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. my, my mother was the recycling captain of our block. So in the <laughs> 1990s, uh, when when the recycling program came to our town, as I know it came to many other towns around the U.S. around that time. Uh, she was tasked with like knocking on uh, the doors of, uh, you know, the maybe 30 neighbors in our vicinity and dropping off flyers to kind of explain that program. My brother and I often got conscripted into helping her <laughs> with that kind of begrudgingly. But, um, <laughs> you know, those were kind of, yeah, just two two things that um, that they were parts of. And then, you know, and then for my brother and I, lots of clubs at, at school, you know, sports, I think, ends up being we were big yeah. members of the swim team, um, in our town. And, and how about yeah. as adults to have either, I think you mentioned that you have, you've kind of both gone on to continue to be parts of clubs. Like, are you doing, you know, are you in book clubs? Are you, you know, uh, you know, have either of you done any sort of town office duties, you know, that sort of stuff? Totally. Yeah. So my, my brother is on the housing commission in our hometown that fights for, you know, more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, and myself, over the course of making this film, um, I was also working on a union campaign myself. And in the film, we use a very broad definition of clubs. So we include right. religious, religious, anything that's getting people together. So while I was working on the film, I was also um, helping to organize a union at my workplace at NBC News that we won in 2019. Yep. Um, and, you know, but I was seeing firsthand what I was seeing in the data, it was really hard to get people out to meetings because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was it's a muscle that a lot of us have lost. And so having a coworker come up to you and say, hey, on Tuesday night, instead of going home after work, do you want to come sit in this conference room and <laughs> we're going to talk about <laughs> you know, issues that are important to us? Um, right. You know, that that was a, a bigger ask than it might have been, as I know now from Bob's data, 50 years ago when people were going to meetings multiple times a week. And that, right. that seemed strange. But you yeah. do do a great job in the film of sort of spelling out that, yes, we're not just talking about club membership. You can also I mean, your your religious affiliation might be part of that. Your union membership might be part of that. Dinner yeah. parties, something as simple as that, you know, which not everybody has groups of friends that they do that with anymore to the. Yeah. Engaged in really, uh, you do a great job of spelling that out. You also do a great job of explaining the benefits, you know, sort of public speaking and, uh, the, you know, um, just getting out of your silo, basically, and be learning how to talk to people with uh, differing viewpoints or different backgrounds. All of that is included in the film. 
Totally. Yeah. And underappreciated also, I think, is the skill of fighting. <laughs> like yeah. us learning how to fight. Fighting with, yeah. you know, with like uh, with some rules in place and, you know, yes. civilly, right? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think there's a difference when you're having to do that fighting face to face, as we all know, versus yeah. fights we've had mm -hmm. on Facebook that quickly devolve and can get very ugly very fast. Right. And don't necessarily need to find a resolution the way you do when you're face to face, because someone can just log off and unfriend someone, as, as many of us, I think, have gone through in recent years, especially as, as our political fights have gotten deeper. Right. So but you do focus quite a bit, um, naturally enough, on sort of the historic fraternal organizations. The film opens intriguingly and, and closes with the Oddfellows uh, group that you uh, where, where are they based? I forget. Uh, They're in Waxahachie in Texas. Texas. Yeah, yeah. Dallas. Right. And, you know, Lions Club, Kiwanis, you know, the Rotary Club, all, all those sort of, you know, old fashioned kind of civic organizations. And yeah. one thing that I'm sure you get, a, you know, asked a lot when you're doing uh, talks uh, after screenings is so Bob kind of touches on it. Putnam um, touches on it a little bit like I don't necessarily he, he says I don't necessarily expect the current generation of sort of college age or 20 somethings or whatever to want to join the Elks Club let's say, yes. but, um, it, it's going to look different for them, but, you know, we still want them to, uh, you know, it would behoove them to be engaged on some level. Can you give me yeah. some ideas, Rebecca, of, um, what that might look like for, I mean, I teach college students right now. They're not, they're not going to join the Elks club, you know? Yep. Um, <laughs> yep. um, but what, what might, uh, affiliations and, 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 and civic, uh, engagement look like for them yep. either now or, you know, as they get towards, you know, parenting years and like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think my, my one pushback on they're not going to join the Elks club is, you know, maybe our Elks clubs or other fraternal organizations have a long history. If they are not bringing in that not younger membership, our hope coming out of this film is, you know, is this an opportunity for older um, clubs that have been around for a long time that aren't getting younger membership to, to take a hard look at maybe ways that they could be updating what they're doing so that yeah. they are bringing in um, younger membership. And I, I think, you know, as you mentioned, we did follow the odd fellows, but also newer clubs that had just started in the last few years, you know, and we wanted to show both cause, cause we don't think that, um, you know, we need to just start totally from scratch. Um, and I think this is true of our religious organizations that have lost a lot of membership. You know, it's time for our organizations, you know, that aren't growing or sustaining themselves to, you know, ask what they could be doing differently um, to, to bring in younger people. And then, you know, as uh, Hillary Clinton, I think mentions in the film, if there's not a club out there that you want to join, create one, right. we want to see all of that happening. So we want to see older clubs that are losing membership, bringing in younger people, reexamining what they're doing right and what maybe they could change. Um, we want to see newer clubs starting. And then I think as this film shows with our archival, what can we learn from older clubs that are still around that they did right, that got a lot of people to join over the years um yeah. so yeah and bring you it towards the end of the film you bring in the guy who created uh the meetup platform which <laughs> is a per i think a great example like that's kind of like if you don't see the club that you want to be a member of uh create it yourself and here and i mean we're all familiar with meetups at this point you know uh, you know mutual interest groups and that sort of thing and that seems to have been an extremely uh, successful venture for him. And that was I think that's a great example of what uh, where the younger folks might be headed. Totally. Yeah. And bringing him in, you know, from the start of this project, the question of how we would tackle tech was extremely yeah. difficult. I mean, and sure. my brother and I just had, you know, hours and hours of conversation over the course of production about how we were going to approach that question. And, you know, I think in being able to show Meetup as an example, um, you know, we we didn't we didn't want to come away with some message of uh, in person, good, not in person, bad, because um, as Hari Han, I think, mentions in the film, you know, tech is a tool and we can use tools to do good things and we can use tools to do bad things. You know, technology was certainly used to to organize a bunch of people to show up at the Capitol on January 6th. Mm -hmm. um, not a good use of tech right. <laughs> for, you know, the strength of our democracy. But, um, you know, in being able to show Meetup, 
you know, we can also use our tech tools to get people offline. We can um, use them to supplement certainly throughout COVID, you know, groups like this, the watch club included has been able to use tech to continue fostering community, even when we couldn't be meeting up in person. And so our hope was that viewers of the film could come away with a new lens, knowing Bob Putnam's work, this social capital lens, as he speaks to in the film, you know, and and then examine in each situation, um, case by case, is this tech helping us build stronger bonds? Or is the tech in this case, pulling us apart. And, you know, I think something like meetup that's getting people out meeting in person is a great example of, of good tech. Right. Uh, you and Pete introduced us to the Kinema platform, which is how we got our, so in the watch club, as I was talking to you about a little earlier, we typically say, well, you know, film X that we really like is already streaming on the platforms. You're not streaming on, you're not on the streaming platforms yet. You're still doing community events and film festivals. And so you have, you, you you know, you made it possible for us to put, to uh, uh, set up a kinema screening. And we had, uh, we, we set up, we, we paid for 50 viewers to watch the film and they got snapped. The the, the freebies got snapped up immediately. Um, and that's a great example of, you know, that's bringing people together like a, a, using tech, but, you know, um, like a book club, for instance, you know, we're all going to join around watching the watching of this film, whatever it might be, uh, yours included. Um, yeah. and then just, and then have a conversation about it. Um, you, oh, you know what I wanted to say? So uh, I'll say one more time, if anybody, don't be shy. If anybody, uh, uh, wants to ask a question of Rebecca, we would love to pose it of her. Um, so you, all you need to do is type it into the YouTube, uh, chat, uh, area and, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, thanks to those of you who I'm using my Newburyport documentary film festival mug. Thanks to those of you who donated to, uh, producer Steve asked for coffee donations for James. And uh, I'm somehow pretty sure that I'm not actually going to get my coffee paid for. It's just going to go right into the the film festival bank account, but that's okay. Uh, so thanks to those of you who uh, uh, donated for, for coffee for me. I do love my coffee. Um, Rebecca, uh, c- can you tell, you mentioned Hillary a few minutes ago and we saw her on screen briefly Obviously, uh, that's a great get for you. Uh, can you tell us? I'm sure a bunch of folks have asked you this to, to tell the story. How, like, who knew who who had connections to Hillary? <laughs> yes, I mean, I, th- there's always a, a journey in terms of booking. You know, on any documentary project, <laughs> sure. of you know, you get one person, then you got to try to get another person, and she, she was, you know, in that pyramid of uh, people we were able to kind of get quickly for an interview, obviously, you know, at the top, because she has a very busy schedule. But, you know, I think our ability to get Hillary and honestly, any of the, you know, academics and researchers, you know, approaching them as someone wanting to do a film about Bob's work, um, you know, really just threw open a ton of doors for us because, you know, all of the people in the film, you know, have really been influenced by his work, his ideas, and equally feel passionately about them. Um, you know, I think for Hillary in particular, it was nice that she could not only speak to the personal history of being in the White House when Bowling Alone came right, out right. and that personal connection, but, you know, also as a historic figure in the women's movement, as we dug into yeah. the importance that club pl- clubs played for, for women, um, you know, organizing. So, you know, having that personal connection that, which is always, you know, better than just having someone cause they're a big name or something, you know, she really had a story to share about meeting Bob and, um, yeah. And, we're, and, we're lucky. Yep. and we know that she and her husband both, I mean, I, I think I probably first heard about the book because Clinton, her husband was talking about it as president, you know, and had, Bob Putnam at the White House. What you mentioned uh, the 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 importance of the women's movement. I I didn't know this. The Frederick Douglass uh, uh, "What to the Slave Is the Fourth of July" speech was first presented to the women's. What was it? The Women's Sewing Club of Is that right? It's up up around you all. I think somewhere near Newburyport. Oh, probably. In, in, oh, well, that's yeah, that's yep. probably right. Actually, oh, okay, wow, amazing. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, and I. Th- no, there's just been so many layers as we would dig into community history, even, you know, book clubs I never put together that, you know, they've often historically been women's clubs. My mother yeah. is in a 30 year long, another club that she was in a group of women, yep. um, you know, and I learned through the course of this film that it was because women did not have access to universities. And so it was a chance to self-educate. 
Um, and that's why, you know, book clubs had traditionally, you know, now we have much more uh, kind of gender diversity in our book clubs, but um, historically they were women's groups for that reason, which was an interesting fact. I also learned. Working on yeah. That. With the few minutes that we have left, I think I want to talk about um, a little bit of your ideas about um, the decline in club membership. Um, I wrote a book about George Carlin, which I bring up quite a bit mm -hmm. because he had something to say about everything. And one of the things that he often said was, uh, I mean, obviously a great comedian. Uh, he what he, Something that he often said was, I love people I individually. And as soon as they... Mm -hmm get together in a group. I don't really want to be part of it. Like he was very much an individualist, very yes, much, yes. very much in the way that a lot of people became, I think in the seventies, which is kind mm -hmm. of the, the era that he's most associated with. Yeah. And I always thought that was a fascinating comment. Like as soon as you get three or four people together, there's, they start thinking in group think, and it's different than just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. Um, so I'm not specifically asking you about George Carlin, but more generally about like what happened in the seventies or so when, you know, Bob Putnam's research will tell us uh, the, 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 the club participation and, and other kind of civic uh, uh, responsibilities kind of took a nosedive. Yeah. I mean, and, and this is where it gets a little tough with the research and for those that want to go on and, and actually read bowling alone, yeah. um, you know, we, we touch on a little bit, but can't go into obviously trying to make a 500 page book into a 99 minute film. <laughs> you know, one of the issues that brought, Bob brought up in Bowling Alone that we do point to in the film is this, the rise of TV. So, mm. you know, as a social scientist, you can really, you know, it's, it's very hard to do. There's, you know, ca causation uh, versus correlation yeah. and correlation, you, you know, he can look at the trends of what else is happening in America around the sixties as we start to see this, this big decline. Um, but it's hard to say for sure X caused Y, um, you know, so he could make some, some educated guesses in looking at trends that were happening at the same time. So a big one he pointed to in Bowling Alone that we bring up in the film is, you know, a rise in TV watching. So people are spending tons more time at, at home, you know, watching TV. And now, you know, that would translate into watching screens, time on our phones, uh, that, you know, previously could have been put to time in clubs. Mm -hmm. um, and there he was able to point to a little more causation by then trying to see, okay, of the people who watch the most TV, how many of them are also club members? Um, right. You know, and we show this graph in the film. Another thing he brings up um, in Bowling Alone that we touch on briefly in the film is also at the same time, women start going into the workplace. So up yeah. until the 50s and 60s, we had half of our population, you know, with, with more time, at home, in the community, not doing a long commute somewhere, able to go to the PTA meetings, able to host, you know, block parties, dinner parties, you know, and Bob is always careful to say, and as a female director, obviously, this is important for me that he's, uh, you know, not spreading some message that, you know, women now should go back home so they can work on our civic infrastructure and get out of the workplace. But, mm -hmm. you know, well, what does that tell us then about everyone maybe needing more free time to be working on community life? Maybe we need to start promoting four day work weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. So we all have one mm -hmm. day home on civic time. Maybe we need to make sure people are you know, able to leave work at five men and women so that they can get to that PTA meeting. And how do we as a culture make that a priority? Child care policies, I think, are, yep. are another thing. And so, you know, I think our hope coming out of the film with with that question is, yeah, well, how do we put on this social capital lens for our policies to make our policies more community friendly, knowing that social capital is so important for our democracy? Mm -hmm. um, he pointed that suburban sprawl was another thing he was looking at in in um, in Bowling Alone as far as like the design of our cities. People started commuting a lot more. Um, but that's where I think a silver lining comes as we come out of COVID. I used to commute two hours every day, one hour to work one way, one hour back, two hours of my life back. Um, you mm. know, if I'm now working remote, those two mm -hmm. hours instead of sitting on a train or in traffic in a car are open hours that could be you know, put into a club, we need people to actually now go do that work to create those clubs who are coming out of this kind of work transition. Um, but I think that's an open question. Um, you know, and it means people closer to home, maybe they have more time during the day to go meet someone in the middle of the day for some civic work in the middle of their work day and, and go right back home if they're not um, traveling so far. Right. 
Um, let's end on a positive note. Um, so we, I think we mentioned the ter- the idea of placemaking earlier before we went on air, uh, which is you know sort of the Jane Jacobs idea of um, making cities livable again and even making the suburbs more sort of community based, you know, giving people gathering spaces and third places and, you know, what's called third places and that sort of thing. Um, In terms of trends, I mean, obviously, yes, we've seen lots of division over the last few years and um, your film obviously talks quite a bit about the, the decline in participation, but what, what would you say is trending in the right direction in terms of community organizing or civic engagement? Yeah, you know, I see a lot of hope, you know, we're as a film director too, we're in a big strike right now. Um, so I think a lot of the the union work uh, that is happening right now is exciting to see, you know, UPS is also about to go on strike. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those are people learning these civic skills in the workplace that as we mentioned in our film, people then take to city hall because you start yep. seeing, you know, I have agency to change my surroundings. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of green shoots in kind of labor organizing that's that's happening because um, it's a great place to learn civic skills, to learn how to hold office, to learn how to public speak. Um, and, you know, and I, I think as I mentioned, um, the, the fact we started this film before COVID, so we had no idea that this was mm. ever going to be a timely film, you know, mm-hmm. we're being able to about community, you know, in 2017, when we start this journey, it has come out to be, you know, unfortunately, timely. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of people are talking and thinking about loneliness. And, you know, that's yeah. another area that I see hope is that it's front of mind, because we all just live through this natural experiment. And we know, um, you know, as, as lucky as we were to have these tools, you know, going through the pandemic in the era that we have, um, I think we all know, and as we showed with Bob's 80th birthday, everyone's singing. Uh, and for those who haven't watched yet, you'll see the scene in the film, he celebrates his 80th birthday on Zoom with on his Zoom, family. Right. Everyone is totally out of sync trying to sing with each other each other. You know, we all can say without any data, an 80th birthday of our grandparent is better in person um, than than on Zoom. And so I think I think we're at a really exciting moment. And I hope this film is a a launching point for some of those conversations about what do we want this new world that we're building to look like as our changes, as our life changes. And as we've seen the the dire need to prioritize this kind of coming out of this. Yeah. And weirdly, it has been kind of a silver lining of the ridiculous pandemic that we're all sick of talking about. I mean, that we we can kind of uh, create some new models from scratch. Um, It's been a pleasure to have you on the, you know, virtual platform, Rebecca. I look forward to hopefully meeting you and your brother, Pete. Uh, in person someday that would be nice um but in the meantime uh this it, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure to uh to speak with you and thanks so much for taking the time i'm going to make sure that everyone uh knows that you can still so yes the free uh tickets to watch join or die through the newburyport doc fest on kinema got snapped up but you can still through august 8th actually we sort of created a pay as you go uh, method of watching. So if you uh, either haven't actually seen the film yet or did see it and want to recommend it to someone else, they can uh, just uh, go to our, actually find us on Instagram, new report DocuFest and uh, click the link and uh, to the, uh, to the film uh, on Kinema and uh, it's 10 bucks a pop. So uh, through August 8th. So you still got time to watch the film. And uh, other than that, we look forward to seeing it when you get yeah, when you you know hit your distribution stride. I would imagine what later this fall or something. Later this year, yep. And our our website's joinerdie.film. So my email's on there. If people have follow up questions, happy to chat. Love hearing about people's clubs. Send us photos. <laughs> That's been a real joy of this tour too. Is hearing about important groups in people's lives in different parts of the country. Exactly right. Well, thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, real pleasure to talk to you, and thanks for bringing us the film. Uh, We'll see you next month on The Watch Club. And I would just like to take a quick minute, as always, to thank our sponsors.